Let's not sugarcoat it. Crypto sentiment is in the toilet. Many are wondering whether they've arrived too late and whether those hypnotic gains are a thing of the past. Well, the answer may surprise you. That's because, according to a recent Crypto VC report, our best days are yet to come. It's not hopium, it's solid facts. And in this video, I'm going to break it down page by page and tell you exactly where all that hidden value could lie. Bonjour, mes amis. I am Chef Guy, the creator of the most delicious, sensual crypto content on the internet. Okay, so I take a whole handful of painstaking research. I mix it with an extra large measure of knowledge. Then I add a generous sprinkling of objectivity and a soupçon of English, uh, je ne sais quoi. Then I mix together inside a warm studio for 40 minutes. I add a number of helpful images and voila, a video all about crypto for you to feast upon. Now, although I may be the most respected chef in all of Paris, I am not a financial advisor, d'accord? So, if your portfolio is looking a little uh, underdone, hmm, I cannot help you. Now, if my videos set a fire in your belly, then remember to subscribe to the channel and ping that little bell too. Then the waiter will inform you when the next one is uh, ready to be consumed. Okay, I must return to the kitchen and to my art. It is time for you to experience the fruits of my labor. Bon appétit. So, what is this report of which I speak? Well, it's the annual State of Crypto report by the crypto arm of Andreessen Horowitz, or A16Z. For those who don't know who they are, it's important to give you a bit of an overview of the firm. That way, you're fully aware of any biases that could be present in the report. Andreessen Horowitz is perhaps one of the most prolific venture capital firms in the world. They have been particularly active in the tech space and have backed hundreds of successful tech unicorns. Everything from Stripe to Lyft, Coinbase to Reddit. I'll leave a link to this site below that details all of those investments. So let's just say that they've been pretty successful by VC standards. Now, A16Z Crypto had its beginnings when Andreessen Horowitz completed a raise for their first dedicated crypto fund. This was for $300 million back in 2018, and it was run by two general partners, Katie Howne and Chris Dixon. Andreessen Horowitz went on to raise two more crypto-specific funds, a $515 million Crypto2 fund in 2020 and a whopping $2.2 billion Crypto3 fund in summer last year. A16Z Crypto can therefore be seen as the division of Andreessen Horowitz that oversees these three massive crypto funds. Now, Katie Hound left A16Z last year and has subsequently gone on to run her own fund, but Chris Dixon remains the top GP in these crypto-specific funds. And when it comes to crypto unicorns, A16Z Crypto has had their hands in nearly every pie. You can see a list of all their investments over here. I'm sure you'll know most of the names on this list. DApps, exchanges, DAOs, banks, NFT issuers, NFT marketplaces. Quite simply, if you are a crypto startup that has been backed by A16Z, then it's seen as a badge of honor. And given that they usually get in on the seed and private rounds with the lowest token prices of all, they can make return multiples we can only dream of. 100x would be an okay return for the likes of these guys. Now, I'm not here to cast aspersions on their business model. VCs fulfill a central role in the funding of new businesses, crypto or otherwise. But it's important to know where they have invested when it comes to assessing the impartiality of their research. And none of this should detract from this year's State of Crypto report, because it really is quite impressive. So, with that intro out of the way, let's dive right in. The first page over here goes over the concept of Web3. Now, this is a buzzword you no doubt hear a lot, and it's important to understand exactly what it means. So, quite simply, Web1 was about the open protocols on the internet. Think TCP, IP, etc. In this network, the value accrued to the users and the builders. Anyone could use it. 
However, in the Web2 space, most of that value accrued to some really large tech companies, the likes of Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. They built these applications on top of Web1 that would allow them to extract the most value from their walled-off silos of information. Now we're in the era of Web3, where the ethos of the early internet has come back. You have the community-governed ethos of a decentralized internet with much of the functionality of Web2 applications. Now this next page over here shows just why the current internet is flawed. Dictatorships on the one hand who develop CBDCs and the social credit system, and big tech oligopolies on the other that are driven by nothing but profit. I do love this chart over here. For those who don't recognize it, it's the S-curve. Essentially, this is a graph that shows how those companies in Web2 started with good intentions. They provided value to new users, and they cooperated. However, as they grew much bigger over time, they have extracted value from users and become hyper-competitive. One of the simplest ways you can look at it is that Web 1 was about reading and getting information. Web 2 was about reading and writing. And Web 3 is reading, writing, and owning. When you own the underlying cryptocurrency that powers the network that the dApps run on, you directly have a stake in it. Now, this page over here further reinforces that notion. In Web 2, those that are at the bottom of the value chain are the users. The investors sit at the top and earn the big bucks. However, with the creation of a token economy in Web3, all those who use the network benefit equally. Now, there is, of course, a lot more to Web3 than this, and I have a video that covers it in depth, which you can find in the description. Anywho, this next section looks at what they call, quote, cycles of innovation, and it's pretty instructive. Basically, Price drives interest, which drives people to think about new ideas, which creates startups, which people can then invest in. That's why it can sometimes be hard to separate out the tech from the price, because they are, whether we like it or not, inextricably linked. This takes the concept to another level, where they try and compare the different volumes of the market cap, developer activity, startup activity, and social media activity. The notion here being that the price, as reflected in the market cap, is driving the other components in the crypto space. These include the developer activity on GitHub, the amount of funding being raised from private investors, and those who talk about crypto on social media. Okay, so that's the innovation feedback loop. Moving on though, it's time to get into the real meat of the report, and that is a look into layer ones. So on this page, they have a list of some of the blockchains people are developing on. They seem to have left out a number of other promising layer ones here, so I would take it with a pinch of salt. I'd also point out that Polygon isn't a layer one, so it's interesting that it's on this chart, but perhaps I'm just being pedantic. Anywho, what's interesting to note is that some of these other layer ones have way more users and daily transactions than Ethereum. That includes the likes of Solana and the BNB chain. Now, one would therefore think that they are more appealing to users, right? Well, not quite. That's because over on this page, they show the amount of transaction fees paid on these blockchains. As you can see, on a seven-day average, Ethereum users pay over 10 times the fees that are paid on the next closest blockchain, BNB chain. Now, some may point to this as proof that the Ethereum blockchain is unsustainably expensive. However, I would counter that this is just a reflection of the demand for that block space. Even though it is more expensive than others, people are happy to pay a premium for the added security that comes from the Ethereum blockchain. Now, of course, this is not to say that there aren't ways to reduce these fees, and I've covered them in a number of videos, which I'll leave in the description. Moreover, there is a hope that with the full rollout of the consensus layer and sharding, Scaling is likely to improve and lower transaction fees will be the result, at least we hope. Now, what all this demand to use Ethereum means is that it's become a bit of a hub in the crypto space. Naturally, other layer ones are looking to capitalize on the high fees and get users onto their blockchains. This is where the cross-chain bridges come in. Now, over here, you can see the top bridges that have transferred value away from ETH in terms of total transaction value. I was quite surprised to see that Avalanche has had the most transferred over. 
This chart shows the top bridges out there based on the total amount of ETH that's been deposited into them. Interesting to see that combined between the Polygon POS chain and the Polygon Plasma chain, there are over 300,000 ETH locked in these bridges. We'd better hope that they are ultra secure. This is relevant when you consider that sitting at number three is the Axie Infinity Ronin Bridge. If you'll recall, this was hacked in April and over $650 million were stolen, one of the biggest hacks on record. Of course, it doesn't help that just before that, the wormhole bridge over here was also hacked for $320 million back in February. Quite simply, bridges are risky, and this is something that Vitalik himself has pointed out on a number of occasions. So although these bridges are encouraging for cross-chain value transfer, they are a potential point of failure. Okay, with that cursory warning out of the way, next page. What this shows is the number of developers working on various protocols since the first commit. It's not hard to see why Ethereum still remains so popular given the amount of people working on it. The only other blockchain that appears to have gone on a similar trajectory at this stage is Solana. Avalanche also appears to be growing quite well since its launch, but it will be interesting to see if it can match the trajectory that Ethereum has achieved. And speaking of this commit graph, the data comes from Electric Capital's 2021 developer report. I actually covered this in a previous video, which I will leave in the description for you. It's well worth your time. Let's move on to the next section though, and this is on layer two scaling. We start over here with a bit of the lay of the land with layer two ETH scaling. One of the most prominent L2 scaling solutions out there has been rollups. And within rollup tech, you have optimistic rollups and zero knowledge or ZK rollups. Optimistic rollups are, as the name would suggest, optimistic about the state of the transactions, but can be challenged if required. However, ZK rollups assume no such thing and require state transitions to be verified off chain. Now, of course, this is just the most basic description of how they differ. And if you want a complete comparison, then I would suggest my video on ETH layer two scaling. Top right, por favor. But the TLDR here is that these two L2 scaling solutions are transforming the Ethereum network. And there are already some really popular projects developing these rollup solutions. This next page compares some of the TVL of the different layer twos based on their underlying protocol technology. As you can see, rollups, and particularly optimistic rollups, are the L2 of choice. Onto this next page here, and they take a look at the fees required to transact and swap on some of these layer twos as compared to the ETH main chain. Quite the difference. Now, I can't speak for some, as I've only personally used Optimism, Loopring, and Arbitrum. If any of you have used the others on the list, please let me know your experience in the comments below. What I will say is that fees shouldn't be viewed in isolation. One should also consider the transactional and computational demand that's currently being sent through these protocols. It's never a zero-sum game with fees. Okay, so that's the state of the L1 and L2 space. Ethereum still dominates and layer twos are competing for the goal of bringing stresses off the main chain. Moving on though, the next section is particularly interesting and it is all about DeFi. This page over here gives some really interesting statistics as to why the current financial system is ripe for DeFi adoption. 1.7 billion people, over 22% of the world's population, don't have access to a bank account. People rely on remittance providers in order to get $650 billion sent home. Now this ain't cheap as the middlemen involved in these remittance transactions take a total of 6% of these transactions. Crazy. Perhaps even crazier than that is the fact that 48% of adults have not sent or received a digital payment for a year. Now, they don't define exactly what digital payment means, but if it means what I think it means, then financial institutions have done a terrible job of making digital banking accessible to these people. It's not like they have an excuse either. Of all those who are unbanked, 1 billion have phones and 480 million have the internet. It's this backdrop that gives you the sense of the raw power that DeFi has to disrupt. And disrupt it has, going from absolutely nothing in January of 2020 to an ecosystem of $100 billion in TVL in just under two years. Of course, 
While over 60% of this DeFi TVL is locked up on Ethereum, it's interesting to see that this has been shifting. It used to be over 95% in late 2020, so competition is increasing. When it comes to the use cases of DeFi protocols today, the bulk of them stem from decentralized exchanges and lending protocols. Trading and borrowing volume on these peaked towards the end of last year. In fact, volume on DEXs like Uniswap at times even eclipsed the volumes on centralized exchanges like Coinbase. Now onto this next page here, and it's all about that ETH proof of stake merge. More specifically, it looks at the total amount of ETH that has been locked in the beacon chain at the time of this report, over 12.6 million ETH and counting. Something I will point out though is the fact that a large proportion of this is with liquid staking providers, the likes of Lido, Stakefish, Kraken, etc. Lido has a full 4 million ETH in its address, or a full 31% of the total ETH staked. Is this cause for centralization concerns? That's something I'll be exploring in an upcoming video, so keep your eyes peeled. Now, despite how large we think DeFi is, it helps to measure it up against some of the biggest players in the CeFi space. If we were to assume TVL was assets under management, it comes in at 31st, so we still have a long way to go. Next section, though, and this focuses on one of the most controversial topics in crypto at the moment. Over here, they give a quick overview of the three different types of stablecoin fiat backed, crypto backed, and algorithmic. Those that are in the fiat backed bucket are the likes of USDC, USDT, or at least we hope, BUSD, etc., etc. Crypto backed are the likes of DAI, which is backed by over collateralized crypto. Then you have the algorithmic that adjusts supply and demand to maintain a peg. That third one was the darling of the crypto space up until a few weeks ago when the UST stablecoin spectacularly collapsed. More about that below. This next chart over here shows the market cap of the stablecoins in question over the past two years. Apart from the fact that it's been increasing rapidly, you should also note that USDC is eating into USDT's market share, perhaps fears over stablecoin regulation. This over here is a particularly interesting chart. It shows the on-chain velocity of various stablecoins, i.e. the number of times that it's being transacted versus the total supply that's outstanding. You can think of it as a benchmark of the popularity of certain stablecoins. DAI and USDC appear to be the highest, and I can only assume this is because of their extensive use in DeFi protocols, liquidity pools, lending, swaps, etc. Whereas it appears as if USDT is either merely being kept as a hodled pile of stable, or it's only being traded on centralized exchanges. Now, we often hear the regulators talking about how much of a risk stablecoins could be. And while they may have a point with algorithmic stablecoins, the stablecoin market cap is still insignificant when compared to the broader money supply. That's best illustrated with this chart over here, which shows that market cap compared to the M1 money supply of some large global economies. A mere fraction, pennies on the dollar. Moving on though, and this next section is on NFTs. Over here, we have an overview of weekly sales in the NFT markets, both primary and secondary, as well as the total market participants, buyers and sellers. What I find surprising here is the fact that although the crypto market has taken a bath, the NFT market appears to have held up quite well. We see that the volumes and market participants are still quite healthy. That seems to run contrary to some of the reporting out there that claimed the NFT market was flatlining. But it appears as if newspapers like the Wall Street Journal were quite selective in the data that they chose and were cherry picking. Surprise, surprise. This next page over here has what is called the take rate for numerous Web2 platforms compared to the likes of OpenSea. Quite simply, this is the fee that the platform takes from those who use it. 30% for Apple iTunes, 45% for YouTube, and 100% for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I can only assume that the reason that those last three are at 100% is because they own all your data and they make all their money from said data. Nothing in it for you. They also have this crazy quote here from Richie Torres, a US congressman. Quote, 
You know something is profoundly wrong with our economy when big tech has a higher take rate than the mafia. Well said, sir. Now, of course, 2.5% for OpenSea seems reasonable in these circumstances. I'll also add that there are NFT marketplaces out there, such as Coinbase's, that charge zero fees. Although it seems as if this hasn't really helped its popularity, but that's neither here nor there. Now, this page over here is particularly captivating for me. It's the return that creators earn on the platforms that they choose to use. When you use centralized, large monopolistic platforms, you are getting the crumbs after they have eaten the bread. However, when you produce an NFT, be it a song, picture, or artwork, you get all the direct value. With NFTs, artists have been able to earn in two minutes what would have taken one million streams on traditional music streaming services. Artists such as Mo Ruff, Black Dave, and Heno have all been able to earn thousands of dollars per NFT drop. Remember, it's not all about profile pic JPEGs. And that's perfectly summarized over on this page, where we see the various use cases that exist for these NFTs. Airdrops, royalties, DAO governance, etc. I've talked about many of the numerous types of NFTs in a previous video of mine, which I will leave in the description for you. Quite simply, NFTs are the future. Yes, there is a lot of hype in the market right now, and a great many of these scam PFP projects are going to zero. But you really need to dive deeper into these other use cases to appreciate NFT's potential. Next section, though, and this is on Web3 Gaming. This page over here shows that whereas the music industry fought against innovation with lawsuits and the like, the gaming industry has embraced it. The music industry stuck with its business models and hoped that it could retain those sales volumes by protectionist measures. Whereas in the gaming industry, it adjusted the business model with the likes of MMOs, free-to-play, and virtual goods. On top of that, the rise of video game streaming brought a new social aspect to gaming that had not existed before. And it seems like that tradition has been continued in the blockchain and Web3 space. These high-level stats are quite telling. 20% of the NFT sales in 2021 were gaming-related. Almost half of all crypto wallet activity has come from games. Moreover, some of these games have generated a lot of active users. Over 50 of them have over 1,000 unique on-chain users at this point in time. And it's not just users and activity, but money. Lots and lots of it. Demand for virtual real estate has been going insane recently. Land sales have now topped $2 billion. However, over 40% of this appears to have come from the likes of the recent hype around the other side land drop to the Bored Ape ecosystem. These land parcels have yet to demonstrate their utility, although I do have high hopes. And you can find out more about the top virtual land ecosystems in my video on it, and you know where to go for that good stuff. So it appears as if gaming is ripe for Web3 adoption, right? Well, not quite yet. That's because from the feedback that I get from the gaming community, they're not all that enthused with the fact that crypto and NFTs are trying to encroach on their ecosystem. Moreover, having played some blockchain games myself, I can confidently say that they aren't all that captivating. So I would say that there's still a great deal of development required before Web3 Gaming can really convince those gamers to join the cause. However, something that I for one don't need convincing of is the potential of DAOs, covered in the last section of the report. Now, I really like this visualization that compares DAOs to your traditional company. The latter is tightly controlled and defined with hierarchical structures. DAOs, on the other hand, are permissionless and allow the broader community to govern the ecosystem they're a part of. It's truly the fairest way for those users to be able to get representation in the protocols they interact with. It's because of this that DAOs have been able to amass gargantuan treasuries, with the AUM in some of the top DAOs reaching over $10 billion. Here are some of the top DAOs in the space, and Uniswap, Gnosis, and BitDAO take the medals. The majority of the value in these DAOs stems from the governance tokens of the protocols themselves, save for BitDAO and Olympus DAO. That's because these governance tokens allow the participants of the DAOs to be able to participate in on-chain voting and the like. 
In total, there have been over 56,000 decisions that have been made in these DAOs from a collection of more than 3.4 million votes. It's safe to say that people are keen on decentralized governance. Of course, I will say that it's not all plain sailing. There have been times when community governance in DeFi has been less than optimal. That's particularly the case when large holders of governance tokens, read VCs, use their token power to push through controversial proposals. But I think it's fair to assume that a report by a VC won't mention this fact. In all seriousness, though, DAOs really do have the potential to transform decentralized governance, and you can learn more about that by checking out my video on it. There's always a video, isn't there? And that is about it for the summary of most of the report. It's quite clear that the Web3 industry is still in its infancy and is going through its own process of creative destruction. Moving fast, breaking things, refining their protocols, and moving fast again. There is a reason that A16Z was able to raise almost $3 billion for all of its crypto funds. Institutional investors want to get a piece of that Web3 pie, and they want to have their money at the cutting edge of crypto VC investing. Now, of course, this report only talked about the positives and the potential. It's interesting to note that the only time that they used the word risk in the report was in the disclaimer. There is absolutely no guarantee that Web3 will be the panacea that we all hope it could be. It's also possible that the TradFi titans and tech giants squash the industry before it can fully develop. It's equally likely that participants in the space can fall victim to their own hubris. This is something that we noticed more recently with the collapse of Terra, a project that was backed by some of the most prominent VCs in the space with billions of dollars. But that is venture investing for you, and it's not exclusive to the crypto space. They say that over 95% of startups fail, so the goal is to make sure the 5% you do invest in really can change the world. And that's it for my video today, folks. But what did you think of the state of crypto? Did you find this report interesting, or is it all just hopium? I'd love to know in those comments below. Now, come a little closer as I have a little secret to tell you. What you're seeing here on YouTube is but a fraction of what I share on my other social channels. Most of these are verified with blue ticks and they include my Telegram Insider channel for daily market analysis and thoughts, my Twitter for announcements and the occasional shitpost, Instagram and TikTok for behind the scenes views and memes, and lastly, but definitely not leastly, my weekly newsletter. It's here that I share my crypto tips as well as a breakdown of my personal portfolio. It comes only once weekly as well and with a spam-free guarantee. Yes, sirree. The links to all of those are in my socials page below. Finally, if you found this video helpful, slap a like on it. Subscribe and ping that bell as well to make sure you never miss another one. Time's up for this crypto guy, but I'll be seeing you guys very soon. Au revoir. Oh, <laughs>